Hey everybody, doing another topic video where I asked a question and now I'm going to react to it. And the question was, who are some of your favorite actors and why? So here we go. I'm only going to answer a few. I get tons of these, but just a handful. The first one, Daniel Day-Lewis. Do I really need to explain why? No, not really. And I honestly, I don't feel like I need to explain why either. I've talked about Daniel Day-Lewis so much on this channel. He is, of course, one of my favorite actors as well. I guess the only thing I could say to add to anything I've said is just, yeah, he is the ultimate chameleon. Just as an actor, I feel like he lives in the skin of a character better than almost any actor in the world. I mean, a lot of people can do it really well, but he kind of just transcends all of that, it feels like. But not only that, he doesn't just inhabit the skin, he inhabits the heart and the soul in a way that is just incredible. His performance as Daniel Plainview, in There Will Be Blood is, to me, one of the greatest performances of all time, at least in American films, and it's my personal favorite performance of all time. And I love just how passionate he is, how committed he is. He really, really takes his craft seriously, goes all in, and you've got to appreciate that. I know a lot of people think he goes overboard, but I honestly think a lot of that is overblown by the media, because if you talk to actors who work with him, they all say he's fine. Like, you know, he's serious, but he's, he's cool. Barbara Stanwyck, she could do drama and comedy better than anyone from her time, and The Lady Eve is endlessly rewatchable. Thank you so much for mentioning Miss Barbara Stanwyck. She is one of my favorite actresses from Hollywood in the 1930s, 1940s period. Totally agree with you. She could do drama, she could do comedy seamlessly. I agree. My favorite performance of hers is in The Lady Eve. She is amazing in that. That is a romantic comedy and one of my favorite romantic comedies of all time. How she is able to be really yeah, like duplicitous, she's very manipulative, and she just wraps Henry Fonda around her finger. Um, but she does it in a way where she's got to be juggling a lot of different abilities as her character. You know, she's got to be very charming and very like humorous, but again, also quite deceitful and very smart and endlessly charismatic. She oozes sexuality just as a person, I feel like, but especially in that this role. That scene where it's, it's completely uncut, all one take, where she is seducing Henry Fonda and then she leaves him just abruptly with the biggest boner of all time. It, I'm telling you, that scene is one of the sexiest scenes I've ever seen in an American movie. It is hotter than porn. Some porn not Japanese. But yes, also incredible in dramatic roles, I think, because she comes off as a person, because she did have a very difficult life, I think. She was a very scrappy person, somebody who really, you could tell she fought really hard all on her own to get to where she was. And that kind of that darkness in her comes out in her eyes and, and just kind of in her, the kind of that subtle grin that she had. And uh, her persona kind of was built on that performance from Babyface, which was, I believe, 1933, and that's pre-code Hollywood. So they were tackling a lot more taboo subjects that they wouldn't a few years down the line. But that really kind of solidified her in the eyes of the public, I think. And then she hones her craft years later, playing one of the most iconic temptress characters or villainesses in uh, A Double Indemnity. So yeah, an amazing woman. Too bad she's not remembered on the same level as people like Audrey Hepburn or Grace Kelly, but I think she's better than them. Clark Gable, a man's man, a woman's man. Fiery temper, fierce insight. Yes, <laughs> that's, I, I, honestly, that might be the most simple but best description of Clark Gable I can think of. You're, you're including everything there. Yes, he was a man's man. In his time, he was considered a very masculine man and, and men wanted to be him. They also wanted to be him because he was a ladies man. He definitely got the ladies hot, myself included. He had a fiery temper. He was a tough dude, more aggressive in his masculinity and more modern in that sense than a lot of men were for the time. Some women don't like the way that he treats his female uh, characters, but I, I disagree. I find it very interesting. I find it very intense. Of course, there are questionable things that he does, especially, you know, with Scarlett O'Hara, Rhett Butler, that whole dynamic is fireworks. That's one of the most intense, most interesting of the Hollywood couples I can think of. But no, I actually think like in movies like It Happened One Night, I like how he treats the Claudette Colbert character because you know, he's not letting her be some spoiled brat. He's like, no, you're not going to be some princess. You know, you're going to do what I say and we're going to get out of this situation. And I like that he treats her equally to the men. I just, I think it's great. 
But also, yeah, I think what, what uh, redeems him is what you say, his fierce insight. He did have the ability to provide wisdom and be kind of uh, more thought provoking as a character in contrast to that, that brute strength. So yeah, for me, I think he's endlessly charismatic. He is one of the most charismatic movie stars, I think of all time. Catherine Deneuve, she has this unique beauty that shines through in every one of her performances. She conveys a lot with just a subtle look, a wince, a smile, a stare. She gives me chills, very versatile as well. Her performance in Repulsion is nothing like Umbrellas of Schoenberg, and that's awesome. Okay, interesting choice, but I'm going to disagree with you. Uh, I, I agree with you to an extent. I think Catherine Deneuve is a unique beauty, certainly really beautiful and very compelling. She has this very icy, elegant allure, but hard to crack that facade, and I think that's what makes her interesting as a presence on screen. Um, but I actually don't think she's that great of an actress. I think it's more just her allure in terms of her appearance that is powerful and not so much her performance ability because I actually wish that she were a better actress. Internally, I feel like she's not internalizing a lot of what her characters really feel. And I think, and yes, I know it's meant to be kind of cold and distant, but there's a way of being able to pull that off in a way that matches internally the emotion. For me, Repulsion, I think I love Repulsion, but I think it would have been even better with a more accomplished actress. Um, and I think her performance in Umbrellas of Sherberg is quite similar to that one. I do actually really like her in Belle du Jour just because I think, you know, you're just casting the perfect person for that particular role, um, tailor-made for her. But overall, yeah, I've just never really been compelled by her. But you know, I get it. <sighs> okay, um, Philip Seymour Hoffman. The man put everything into every role, whether it be share sharding in his pants and along came Polly, or leading in a cult in The Master. Any movie he's in is worth seeing just to see him work. Yeah. He's one of the few actors, I tend to go to movies more for the writers and for the directors, not so much for the actors. He is somebody that I would, I would go see a movie for him. He is one of the most talented actors of his generation. I talk about Daniel Lewis and how he kind of transcends in terms of being a chameleon. I feel like Philip Seymour Hoffman is right underneath him. The talent that that man had the reason he had such an incredible career is because he could do anything. As you say, he could be in Along Came Polly. He's amazing in that performance, really. I mean, it's such a, a silly movie, so dumb. And yet he has just like this energy to it and he puts his all in it and he's hilarious. And then yes, he can be in a Paul Thomas Anderson movie. He was in some of the great American films of the 90s and of the 2000s, really. I mean, Synecdoche, New York and, and The Master. Very, very rarely do I get lost in a performance by an actor, especially if it's a famous actor. I, I, I usually, I can't disassociate from their persona outside of things or their personal lives just because of the way that, you know, media is. But he is the one actor where no matter what he plays, I am convinced by it and I completely fall into his performance. That's how good he is. He was a passionate man, a, a student of, acting as well as you know just like a student of the theater and um it's a shame that he died the way that he did you know a lot of artistic spirits sometimes are very sensitive and the world can get them down and it's a tragedy he wasn't able to be saved i'm a huge fan of tony collette she has an extremely expressive face she may be the only actor who can frown like a cartoon character in a drama and make it emotionally effective I also love the choices she's made. Her body of work has required her to experience some of the darkest depths of the human experience. Her performances in Hereditary, Glassland, and Japanese Story in particular are so raw, guttural, and visceral. At the same time, she also does work which is much more spirited and joyous, particularly Little Miss Sunshine and The Way Way Back, and also demonstrates great talent for comedic works like Knives Out or Muriel's Reading. Yes. Toni Collette is one of the most underrated actresses and she has worked in this business forever. I first became aware of her in 1997 when I was six years old, seven years old. And um, it was her playing Harriet in Emma. I was a huge Jane Austen movie buff as a little girl and I loved her in that performance. She was radiant and, and you know bubbly and all of these things, just a joy to watch on screen. And she has such range, really. In a way, she's almost like a, a female seem, a, a female version of Philip Seymour Hoffman. That's hard to say. Just because, yeah, just look at the range of characters and the range of films she's had throughout her career. And yet the reason why 
she is able to maybe not be a movie star could be because she separates herself from that world and in the media and all that but a lot of it i think is because she's such a great chameleon and great actors are able to be taken seriously for that outside of their work she's never gotten the recognition as somebody like philip seymour hoffman and that's a real shame but i do think you know the really good actors the passionate actors love doing the work and they're less concerned with getting a, a, an award those are the actors i respect the most but yes tony collette one of the most underrated and one of the most talented, for sure. John Cazale, each of his five performances brought a poignancy and emotional depth to those movies that made each of them a masterpiece. John Cazale is a very a, a lucky person because he was able to be in several of the most iconic American movies of the 1970s, all within a very short period of time before he died. I mean, really think about it. He's in The Godfather Part 1, Godfather Part 2. He's in uh, The Deer Hunter, in The Conversation, in Dog Day Afternoon. That's an amazing resume. But why he is so amazing is because of how understated he was. There's not a moment in any performance where it doesn't feel completely authentic. And it's just because he knows how to be subtle. He plays things real. And actors like that very rarely get their recognition. It's so easy to be, you know, really into these bigger than life performances. But honestly, some of my favorite actors are the ones that play it real. And he is one of the greats of that, a master of understatement. My favorite performance of his is actually in Dog Day Afternoon. He is the perfect contrast to somebody like Al Pacino, who, of course, his character's bigger than life and quirky and, you know, just all over the place. Of course, he's giving us the show and it's wonderful, but he's the wonderful understa understated contrast to that character where you sense a lot of pain in who that person is, yet he doesn't give you a lot. A lot about that character is unknown, yet he, he he's very funny when he needs to be, dark when he needs to be, but it's const constantly a, a slow burn of a performance. Benicio Del Toro is definitely top tier for me. He was described once as an acting animal, and it shows. His ferocity and emotional rawness, even in films that are less than subpar, leaps off the screen. He is definitely someone who makes choices that you might think are rather ridiculous, but coming from him, they're insanely perfect choices. I've loved his work thus far and can't wait to see what he comes up what comes up for him in the future. Yeah, Benicio Del Toro is one of my favorite actors, and you're right. I mean, he just, he's an acting animal. He's just got this primal kind of Neanderthal like physicality where he just snarls and he gets into it. The grit of it is really amazing. And, you know, it's like right on the edge of, of like abstraction, right on the edge of farce and yet not quite. He really is a, a titan. And I think he's done so many of the most uh, harrowing performances, also comedic performances. Of course, I love him in uh, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas with Johnny Depp is amazing but there's a danger to him an edge where you just you never know what he's going to do those are also some of my favorite actors people like that like daniel day lewis is one of them james cagney was one of them just right on the edge is always very exciting but yeah those are just a few i wanted to just kind of do a quick video on this maybe i'll do a part two at some point but uh thank you guys so much for the questions and um all my social media information is below you can watch more videos here and you can subscribe if you'd like Catch you next time.